I'm uh, glad to have this opportunity to tell you about the UHN framework that's being proposed for this very controversial topic. Um, I you know, always want to emphasize that this is a very controversial topic. Everybody has an opinion and this talk could go for two hours if we uh, wanted it to. Uh, but the main message I want to give people is really the time for debate about if we should do this is over. Uh, the point is, how do we do this with appropriate safeguards? And that's what I want to tell you about today. So, uh, but part of alleviating some of the concerns around this is to give information about the impact of medical assistance in dying around the world. And what we know is that there are very few jurisdictions uh, in the world where it is legal. Uh, it, it's legal in four European countries, four American states, and now Canada. And what we know is, from the centers where it has been legalized, the impact of it has been that there has been very little uh, negative impact on growth of palliative care services, on escalation of the practice over time, uh, and on disproportionate use in vulnerable populations. So the concerns that originally arose don't seem to be uh, arising in, in centers where this has been available. And what we know is in the whole landscape of end-of-life care, Really, assisted dying is a small fraction of the pie. The bulk of end-of-life care remains and always will be palliative care. And that's built into our protocol to ensure that that's in place. I will give you some data from what we've learned from Oregon, and that is that requests for physician-assisted dying uh, in 2015 accounted for only 0.4% of deaths. And the population tends to be an older population, largely university educated, the bulk of them, 72%, are in the cancer population, although you also see requests from neurologic diseases and cardiac diseases. I think it's interesting to look at the, what we've learned from Oregon around the reasons why patients request this. And actually, pain, inadequate symptom control, is not the main reason. 29% of people were concerned, uh, were requesting it on the basis of inadequate pain control, but the bulk of the reasons are what I would classify as existential distress. So people are worried about not being able to enjoy activities, loss of autonomy, dignity, concern about family, which is why supportive care is such a big part of implementing this at UHM. So I could also uh, give you a lot of background on the historical and legal context of the development of how we got to where we are now, and that will be coming eventually in the educational uh, platform that we're building. I'm going to just start with the latest uh, round, which is Bill C-14. Medical assistance in dying has been defined as two things. One, where the medical practitioner actually delivers a toxic lethal substance to a patient with the intent to end their life or B, that we just prescribe a medication that a patient can take on their own and cause their own death. And I will tell you that currently at UHN, we're not going to be offering the B part. So the, the medical assistance in dying is only clinician administered and it will be intravenous medications at this point. So we should go over, because you'll need to know this in talking to patients, what are the eligibility criteria? And I, Bill C-14 uh, is in some ways much simpler than earlier versions of proposed legislation in that uh, they do not allow for assisted dying uh, for patients um, who are under the age of 18, for minors, uh, for primarily mental health disorders, and they are not allowing for advanced directives. This is the current eligibility criteria. You have to have health services funded by the Government of Canada. You have to be at least 18. You have to be capable of making healthcare decisions. You have to have a grievous and irremediable medical condition. This has to be a voluntary request by the patient, not by proxy, not coerced by anyone. And the patient has to agree to it and provide informed consent. Um, and our protocol builds all of these components in if you just uh, follow the protocol. So how do you determine grievous and irremediable, according to the bill? You have to have a serious and incurable disease, and I, I think that's the key. Um, you also have to be pretty close to the end of life, so you have to have um, this incurable disease and be in an advanced state of irreversible decline in capability. There has to be enduring physical and psychological suffering that's intolerable to the patient, uh, and cannot be relieved under treatments that's acceptable to the patient. So that's not our judgment, that's really up to the patient if they find something that's intolerable and whether there's a treatment that they will accept. 
And then natural death has to, have been, has to be reasonably foreseeable without needing to specify what a prognosis is for that patient. Um, and that is part of the controversy around the bill that reasonably foreseeable isn't defined, but they're trusting clinicians to be able to make that assessment. So we'll see in the end, but as, as you can see, it's actually fairly challenging to determine when a patient meets these criteria because it is a, a little nonspecific. Where the legislation is helpful and clear is the, in the safeguards that they've built in. So the patient has to make a request in writing after being told of their diagnosis and prognosis. The request has to be witnessed by two independent witnesses and there have to be two independent medical practitioners who confirm eligibility. So they don't require going to the superior court, any kind of judge, it's just a request, two witnesses, two doctors say you're eligible and it's permitted. The patient has to be told that uh, they have the right to withdraw the request at any time in any form. There have to be at least 10 clear days between the request and delivery of the intervention. Uh, so there has to be at least 10 days. The assessment team will determine what lo how long it should be. It can be less if death uh, is imminent or loss of capacity is imminent for that patient. And then immediately prior to delivering the intervention, the patient has to be given an opportunity to withdraw the request and to pr and ask for express consent. So those are the safeguards that have been built in. So the way we're implementing it is that we have checks and balances where first the organizational administration for MAID is coming under the Department of Supportive Care. We are, of course, allowing for conscientious objection among staff to occur. And because of that, we're just taking that piece out of the algorithm. So um, we're not asking staff, you know, who are, uh, who patients are making this request of if they're conscientiously objecting or not. We're going to develop separate teams of voluntary staff who, there's the clinical team who receives the request and talks to the patient initially. They are then required, if the patient continues to want this intervention to refer to a voluntary team of doctors and um, clinicians who will do an assessment for eligibility and then there is a voluntary team of intervention specialists who um, and these are physicians and nurse practitioners who will actually deliver the lethal medication and the thought is that together these teams will meet all of the legislative requirements and at the same time ensure that optimal disease and symptom control, access to palliative supportive care are happening throughout the process for the patient. And what I mean by that is this is what our algorithm looks like. So it's very complex and I'll break it down in the next few slides. Uh, but there is a algorithm for the clinical team at the top, an algorithm for the assessment team to follow, and then an algorithm for the intervention team. And you don't necessarily need to know the details of the assessment and intervention algorithm other than to advise patients about what the process is. I wanted to emphasize that um, along all steps of this pathway, all arrows at every point come to optimizing disease and symptom control and uh, making sure there's adequate support of the palliative care. This algorithm uh, has built in seven safeguard forms. So the clinical team has three. They have a physician request form that the physician, the attending physician fills out, a patient request form, and then a supportive care referral form. I'll go over those a little bit. I won't go over in detail the assessment team form, what the assessment team has to determine, how they're determining capacity and, and um, irremediable suffering. Uh, and then the intervention team, where the, it's the intervention team who actually obtains informed consent from the patient. Uh, there's a pharmacy prescribing form and then a chronology summary form. So I won't go through all those forms in detail, but I will show you this part of the algorithm for the clinical team, because that's where you will uh, probably encounter this the most. So you have an adult patient who's making the request. So the clinical team member, and it's not necessarily a physician, and we've certainly had cases where the request came to a nurse or a dietitian or an occupational therapist. Uh, but, so what the clinical team member is asked to do is uh, just to have a discussion with the patient, what the reasons for the request are, to let them know what the eligibility is, right? So if this is a patient with a spinal cord injury, they need to be told, you're not eligible, and the conversation stops from the beginning. And so you're going to talk to the patient about why they are asking for this, what the actual eligibility criteria that I just went over are, what our process is, that there's a separate assessment team they'd be referred to, uh, and an intervention team. Let them know that if there is a reflection period, so you can't, they can't say, I want 
physician assisted death and it'll be tomorrow. They have to know there's this required period. Uh, and then you notify the intending MD the same day. The intending MD will also discuss this, but in addition has to discuss with the patient the diagnosis and prognosis, adequacy of current symptom management and options for alternatives to physician assisted dying. As I said, we're going to have a dedicated made supportive care team of palliative care, psychiatry, psychology, social work uh, that will deal with the supportive and palliative care for patients requesting made. So there's a separate referral form for that that you can refer to if you think it's needed, but maybe it's not needed. Maybe you have a very rational patient who's asking for this. So that's at the discretion of the attending physician. Ultimately, the patient decides whether they want to proceed, and if not, you optimize control, and if yes, you fill out the relevant forms that I mentioned. Okay, so here's the assessment team algorithm, which really is just um, the specialists that will be required for the assessment, and it, and it can be either another medical specialist, you know, if it's a neurologist, if it's an ALS patient, an oncologist, if it's a cancer patient, or a palliative care physician or a psychiatrist. If there's any urgency, the patient will decline quickly, like within a week, we will do this within 48 hours. Uh, if patients are found not to be eligible, they have a right to appeal and go to a consent and capacity board. Um, I have to be given the forms for that uh, so that they can get another opinion. If they are eligible, the assessment team will determine this waiting period, which will be at least 10 days, unless uh, it's more urgent than that. It comes down then to the intervention team who comes in, and the inter it's the intervention team who obtains this informed <coughs> consent built into the agreement form. Um, so after informed consent, the patient can change their mind. So they either know and you're coming back to supportive care, or uh, you proceed and determine timing and location um, and you make, this is when you make the referral to the Gift of Life Network for a discussion about organ donation, assuming that um, the waiting period has passed. On the topic of timing and location for MAID at UHN, we are going to be delivering this intervention in hospital only, so there will not be an option of traveling to the patient's home to deliver the intervention. Uh, so we will have, we, and we also don't think it's appropriate to admit patients for the purpose, so there will be a designated day unit at every hot UHN site where outpatients requesting MAID will come for the intervention. Patients who are already inpatients and can't be discharged uh, will have it done on their inpatient units. You complete the dispensing record and then the uh, intervention is delivered, uh, patient is given immediately prior the opportunity with, to withdraw the request and give express consent. The intervention team member must remain at bedside until death, and that can be either the physician or the nurse practitioner. And then you document the events in the patient's electronic med medical record, but also complete the chronology summary form for review with a UHN made review board. So this review board will meet quarterly and review all cases and collect statistics around intervention, reasons, what's happening. And the last thing I'll mention is we are also developing as part of the framework a staff support team. So spiritual care, medical ethics, social work and psychiatry to debrief and support individual staff or clinical units who are experiencing distress related to their patients requesting or undergoing this.